Karin, it's you. your turn. So uh, I hope it will be useful. Uh, in any case, uh, everything I'm going to introduce is going to be uh, from a company point of view because I work in a localization company. And thank you very much for the presentation before. Uh, indeed, we are going to have themes that are going to, to come back. It's a lot about um, fun, it's a lot about creativity. And we are, um, when we localize games, we are also uh, providers of fun. So I'm going to start um, to, by introducing myself. I now work in a localization company called Altagram. So we mainly localize video games. It's about 99% of what we do, I would say. Um, I have a two master's degree from Paris <coughs> in translation and in multicultural communication. So um, that was technical translation and we also studied uh, uh, working with different languages, uh, how to communicate uh, on different platforms, what uh, different cultures expect. So that was uh, pretty useful for what I'm doing now. I started working um, in the translation industry when I was in Paris. I worked in a technical translation agency. And then I was um, recruited by Nintendo of Europe in Frankfurt am Main. And that's how I came to Germany. So that was uh, already six years ago. And um, so when I was at Nintendo, I started working as a French translator. So English to French, no Japanese to French, unfortunately. <laughs> So, um, English to French, I had the opportunity to translate some pretty cool games, such as New Super Mario Bros. Wii. And I just love playing it and seeing my name in the credits and bragging <laughs> about it. <laughs> so, uh, in reality, it's a very small game. It's like 1,500 words. It takes half a day to translate it, but still, it's <laughs> Mario, you know? Um, I also uh, worked in some uh, bigger games, such as Xenoblade Chronicles which was uh, a bit more famous, and also had these weird creatures and their weird language, and they all had to be different, but with uh, similarities, and that was hell to translate. It was uh, really difficult, so I really related to what you were saying, and I hope the French translation is better than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Of course, when you, when you translate, it's always, uh, someone is going to be disappointed if they compare to other languages, because it's not just translation. It's so after working as a translator at Nintendo, I um, worked as a translation coordinator. So still for Nintendo projects, uh, coordinating between the different languages, the producers, the developers. And then I moved on to um, localization companies, so video game localization companies, because I'm not leaving the industry now that I'm in. <laughs> and, and now I am translation manager at uh, I don't know how that works, though. So. <laughs> and uh, Altagram. Small switch. Sorry. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so what Altagram does in Berlin is um, localization for video <coughs> games. That includes a lot of translation, but it also includes a lot of um, audio recording, which is also pretty important. Um, we also uh, offer um, testing, some quality assurance, or um, DTP, desktop publishing if necessary, and also creative writing, trans creation, uh, anything that can be related to uh, localization. You know, I see my little text doesn't fit in the text boxes. Antagram <laughs> <laughs> um, is um, it's quite a small company. It's a very young company. We were funded um, one, about one year ago with people who used to work together in another company mainly, so uh, we all have a lot of experience in the field and working together as well. I'm not going to describe everything here, it's uh, pretty standard in companies and it's not the most interesting, I think. Um, so something to come back to is fun. Uh, we are a fun team, we like to do things like that for Christmas cards, so... <laughs> Um, we work on all sorts of platforms. So I was saying earlier that at the moment the mobile industry is booming. Everyone has a mobile phone, everyone plays. Even people who say they don't play are playing Candy Crush and they don't want to admit it. Or other <laughs> games <laughs> that they can admit to. Or, uh, but everyone is playing something or other now. Um, also, um, everyone has access to a PC, internet, we have Steam, we have those PC games. Every, almost everyone has a console at home. 
Um, so yeah, the, the game industry is, uh, is really doing good at the moment. And um, so the video game localization industry is also working a lot. We basically work with um, any language in the world, but um, normally um, games are translated into about um, 30 languages. That's uh, what comes most. So you have all of Europe, and then you have uh, English, and uh, Mexican, Colombian, Spanish, uh, Portu Brazilian, Portuguese, and then you have all those Asian languages, of course, which are always uh, a pretty, it's a pretty big market. A lot of games come from there, but they also um, translate a lot into Chinese or Korean. So just an overview of all the languages uh, we don't work with, and we regularly work with. So um, that's quite a bit to do. Make you have a quick look. <laughs> Um, so those are some of the um, titles we recently worked on. Um, it's very uh, varied. There's a lot of everything. In some cases we did some translation. In some cases we did a lot of audio. So um, about localization for us, it's mostly about translation and audio recording. So some titles are nice, some are, are children's titles, uh, have console games. Maybe that <coughs> Okay, um, I'm going to move on directly to. Uh, look. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm going to do a bit of teaching. It's probably something that you already all know: uh, the difference between translation and localization. And this is not necessarily how I use it all the time. So um, when I say translation, I mean localization in the sense of we don't purely translate. We make sure that it's adapted to. Um, the, the country, the region, the culture. Uh, I usually, I will always say translate, but I always mean localized because we don't do um, pure translation. This is more about technical translation, and this is not what we do. Um, localization is also um, it also includes all the services that we would provide. Um, so localization is also uh, all the services together. For instance, translation plus audio. This is also localization. Uh, I know it makes things a bit more complicated, but usually when I will say localization, I mean translation in the sense of localization. And when I say translation, I also mean localization. So <laughs> okay, now it's pretty more complicated, but uh, basically we don't do simple translation. We always do localization. Um, and I'm going to start with some uh, some of those cultural challenges uh, that we have to work on. I chose some German examples, since I hope it will appeal to most of you. Um, so it's not always easy to translate, we are localized, into uh, a different language. Um, and one of these issues here, that was a, that was a game uh, where, like a hidden object game, something very simple except that the explanations were not text, but they were images. So um, the text contained plans, which in theory is great, can be creative, except that in that case, um, there were images as well. So what do you do in that case? Uh, you know, just translate, like explain what's in the image so that the people can find the, the object, or um, try to translate the plans and then the people cannot find the object. So in that case, um, the translations are very boring, especially the last one, which is very nice in, um, in English, hedgehog, hedgehog, and then the, the German Jugendschwein is maybe not, uh, not as fun, but at least the players will be able to find the objects. Um, so the, the translator has to make a choice. But they need to have all the elements and they have the text and they need to make a choice what is going to be more important, is it going to be the information, is it going to be the pants? Is it going to be the humor, the style? Those are questions that, when you localize, you need to ask yourself. What is, who is going to read that? Uh, in what context? Uh, how is it going to happen? So this is also a challenge. And you were talking about challenges a lot. And localization is a, a constant challenge. And you learn every day. It's learning all the time. Um, in the same way. Um, the graphics have to be changed. So this is not um, this is not necessarily the text, but 
but it's also a cultural aspect that we have to work on. And this is what we do when we work on uh, DTP, for instance. Um, we don't necessarily make these changes, but sometimes when you're translating a game, uh, you notice issues like that, and you have to tell the developers, hey, I think this would not work in my language. So um, in that case, we are also language consultants. And, and because we know uh, the market, we know the culture, and we can say, hey, yeah, I know this, the words say that, or this character is called like that, and you say you don't want to change the name, but what if it doesn't work in my country? So for instance, Pokemon, um, which is Nintendo as well, it's pretty big on that. So you have different, uh, the, the top one is the, the Korean version, and the sage praying. Nintendo forbids any reference to religion whatsoever. So this has to be changed. So now he just looks grumpy, arm crossed. That's okay for Europeans. <laughs> and the uh, same, we have the, the jinx. Um, like skin color might have been an issue to stay politically correct. We just make it purple and everything <laughs> is okay. <laughs> so we have the Korean version and the European version. And here is an even less politically correct example, yeah. but one you probably all know. So Wolfenstein, um, in that case, the work done on the game to uh, um, release it into Germany was massive, um, because the so the swastikas were used everywhere in the game. All the reference to the uh, Nazi regiment were changed to uh, Levi. <coughs> um, so everything needed to be changed in the game. That's also, it's not us, of course, it was a uh, uh, who did the work, but uh, it's still a lot of work, just for one, uh, one country, one, uh, one market, but it's very important. Otherwise, the game cannot be released, or it cannot be accepted, it's uh, illegal, you know, you have lots of aspects to take into account, and this is a game where knowing the, knowing the culture and taking all elements in, into account is important. So. Like, this is a summary of uh, uh, what I'm gonna, the, the four points I'm going to talk about. The first two are going to be very developed. The second, the, the last two I'm going to brush over really quickly, but this is something that we also might have to work on, so I wanted to mention them anyway. And I will start with translation, unless you already have some questions I forgot to mention, but uh, if anyone wants to ask questions, just at any time, feel free to. Uh, so translation is uh, my specialty. <laughs> I'm definitely a language person. Um, so translation, um, we usually include translation, editing, and proofreading. That means that we don't just translate, we make sure that someone reviews um, all the text that we, we work on. As I said before, um, there's a cultural element that is very important. So we work with uh, native speakers. Um, have to, and they have to live in the country because language evolves all the time. Um, some culture references uh, change, so it's pretty important to have people who live in the country uh, to, and then know the market, the players, the everything. Um, it's also nice to work with people who know about games. It helps. It's not that easy to translate a video game. Uh, it's a lot of creative work. Uh, sure, but you have to understand how the game works. Um, who is going to read what, where, when, and how. Uh, you're not going to translate UI text or uh, button names in the same way you're going to translate the uh, script, for instance. So this is, um, this is also quite important. To come back to the company, um, we can work internally on German, English, French, and Italian, but we rely mostly on freelancers and the business in general relies uh, a lot on freelancers um, since you know, we have these 30 plus languages that have to be translated and for this we try to work with people who live in the, in the country so um, it's a lot <laughs> lots of people um, that means that it's a lot of freelancers to handle and uh, the translation department of a company usually includes uh, vendor recruitment, vendor management you have to test those translators and make sure that they, they correspond to what you're looking for and that they can work on these, uh, on the, the translations because you have to be able to trust them. Um, another important aspect is cat tools. I think we might hear about that a bit later. Um, so cat tools are also a really, really important thing. 
Uh, you to be able to, uh, work, when you work on big games, you might have five translators working on a single project. You have to make sure that the terminology is uh, the same, that the styles are not too different. Even if you have uh, an editor that looks through everything at the end, you know, uh, it's always good to uh, be able to work at the same time on, a cat on uh, the same cat tool, and that helps. Uh, same with other games with weekly updates, for instance it's good to go back to the same terminology. Um, and then the, the, everything that's creation, creative writing, all that, um, would also go into the translation department, even though uh, we wouldn't use the same people. It's uh, very different specifications and, and uh, requirements. It includes also copywriting, uh, creating uh, keywords for SEO, uh, writing marketing text, so there is also quite a bit in there. Um, when we translate a game, what do we translate? Um, of course, everyone is going to think about UI, the tutorial, dialogue, scripts, and that's a pretty big aspect, but that's not all. Um, first, the titles, items, locations, uh, character names, uh, all this is uh, included in a um, bit of a creative work that's a different from uh, just translating. If you, yeah, you, have to, you have to work on this. Uh, you might have to follow a glossary, you might have to, um, developers might say, no, I want this to stay in English, for instance. Um, those are all elements that you need to take into account. And then you have the not front part, which is going to be uh, manuals, uh, all the legal contents. Um, I can tell you that translating a EULA is not as fun as translating a script, <laughs> but it needs to be done. <laughs> so. Um, for these, for instance, um, I work with translators. I would not use the same translators. It's also important, but still, they have to they have to know what is going to be for. So um, it's there. Um, at the moment, a lot of store descriptions and screenshots. We work a lot with mobile games, so you have to take uh, this into account as well. Uh, if it's going to go on uh, on Google Play or on Steam, it has to be introduced. So um, it's not always translation then, it might be uh, uh, writing or transcreation. So you might have to just explain a bit about the game, which is not always easy when you don't have access to the game yet. Um, then you have a lot more that revolves around the game itself, um, like the websites. Um, some, game have, some games have um, apps, like to create the buzz, they create a lot of content around. They have trailers that go out uh, a lot of times <coughs> on the the game is released, uh, press releases, so um, and then you have patch information, developer diaries, forums, blogs, um, and, and uh, everything that you can think of that will mention a game or, or the release of a game or describe something from a game. It might go through a, a video game localization company. So to go back to the concrete work. Um, the process, I think, I'm going to uh, go to this slide, which is not so nice for you. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the first step, when let's say I'm going to um, give the example of a rather large game, because uh, it involves um, more steps, and it's more fun for us as well to receive a larger game to translate. So. <laughs> when we get, the, um, we get a request, let's say, from a developer or a publisher, um, they want to translate something, um, we have to request um, additional documents, any reference material, all that, uh, to be able to analyze and prepare the, the project. The project does not start on the day um, they say, okay, you have to go, translate, you have one week, 250,000 words, hop. <laughs> it doesn't happen like that. Um, so basically, it's uh, taking uh, into account all the information we receive and the, the requirements and the specifications from the client to try to analyze what's going to go on and, and uh, plan a bit, imagine uh, the budget, the timeline, schedule. Um, so it's like what's happening behind the scene, basically. And this has to be done as early as possible. Um, because when, the, when your client or the developer, the, the, the publisher is gonna say, okay, I want it next week, you have to be ready. It, it's always like that. <laughs> uh, 
so we try to set up the teams um, in a way that uh, you know we try to see uh, who's better on, on which type of text and uh, who's going to be better at this platform. The requirements are usually different, so projects have different specifications. Uh, clients are going to ask for um, terminology to be followed, you have to take into account uh, sequels, um, prequels mostly, <laughs> and franchise, uh, anything like if the if the game, for instance, was already a um, cartoon or an animation, you have to use the same terms. So this is something that you need to think about before everything starts. Then you set up the team, you give them the, uh, all the, the documents you, you have, um, they have to start working on terminology. If you have access to the game, uh, you can also start playing. But let's be honest, you never have access to the game. <laughs> uh, most of the time, the, the builds are not even uh, the game is not even finished, so uh, there are no builds of the game. Um, so then the translation starts, and as you see, there is a lot of preparation before the translation can start. Um, so it's what I said earlier, translation and then proofreading mostly. Uh, you have to make sure that everything is done within the specifications, and that includes uh, um, the uh, instructions which are followed. Um, if translators have questions, they have to ask the questions, whether they get answers or not. But it's important to, to ask questions, try to understand as much as possible of the, of the context, and really uh, get to know the game. Um, it's great to see the, the text, to know a game, but uh, if, you, if you cannot play the game, it's not always easy to just try to translate, imagine the context, uh, imagine who's talking to, to whom about what, and the genders, it's a lot to think about constantly. So questions help uh, if you don't have enough reference material or the game. Um, then uh, we also work a lot with the QA tools. So we work a lot with MemoQ. I don't know, I didn't mention it before. So, uh, we work with MemoQ and uh, we use uh, QA checks from MemoQ, but we also use some tools, uh, other tools as well, which I can talk about later too. <laughs> And uh, we make sure that all the, the answers um, have been implemented in the, in the translations. Sorry. Um, once this is done, then the, the, there is also um, behind the scene a game work where you have to uh, export, you have to clean, you have to make sure that the, the files look the same at the end as they looked at the beginning and uh, send it to the client. So. This is for the process. I mean, we also expect feedback, we do post-mortems. Um, that can be quite useful to, to work on further projects and understand what, what went well, not so well, trying to improve things. It's always great. Now, about the tools we work with. Um, so everyone is thinking, yeah, cap tools, translation memories, um, sure. They are pretty important. And so as I said, we work a lot with the MemoQ. I would say 93-94% of our projects are done directly in MemoQ. Um, we work with a, a few other tools like um, um, Trader Studio, uh, Deja Vu. And then it depends on what the, what the clients send us. Um, other tools that we don't mention enough are uh, glossaries, terminology lists. Um, so, very often they are provided by clients, uh, but we also have to create them sometimes. And style guides and guidelines are also quite important on larger projects, not necessarily on uh, the 200 words that are never going to come back, but imagine you have, a, you have a, your game, which is not big, but every week you have 500 word updates then it's important to, that everyone knows what's going on uh, and all the information about the project and how it needs to be translated. So uh, side guides are, are always pretty important. They might sound boring, but they help. Um, most of the files you receive are Excel files. So I'm going to mention uh, Excel. <laughs> it's actually pretty interesting because you can uh, develop add-ons and, and macros and things like that. Um, which are great, let's face it. I don't want to create those, but uh, <laughs> it's not my domain. No, uh, sometimes I, I also play with Excel. Not my 
favorite, but uh, but it can it, it can be great because yes, you can add um, an add-on that is going to help you count words, for instance, just by clicking once uh, before importing everything into MimoQ. Um, you can uh, check that uh, you can check the terminology. Like let's say you have one word, has it already been translated? Uh, has it always been translated the same way? You can check for prohibited terms. Like I don't want to see that in my text has been used in the file. So there is a lot you can play with uh, in Excel, and uh, it's not a tool we are going to use to translate, but it's a great tool to start analyzing the file and, and try to figure out what's what's in there and what's in there at the end as well. So I, I always mention Excel. Um, we often receive lots of HTML or XML files, and these are not so much fun. <laughs> So one of my favorite tools is Notepad++. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, we also have to work with that. We have to be able to see what's in the file. Of course, MemoQ, you can import a lot of stuff in there. Just don't even have to open it. Just say, tell MemoQ, OK, look, I want to translate that. And MemoQ is going to analyze. But yes, it's an XML. I see. I'm going to extract the text for you. But you still need to check that it's OK. <laughs> Unless you're really good with um, regex and filters. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, you need to see. And at the end, you need to be able to open the file and see, OK, um, was it OK? Because the CSV I received from the client was maybe a bit weird. So yes, Notepad++ plus plus is your friend. And then I mentioned um, QA tools. So uh, I used to work a lot with Xbench in the past which was uh, pretty good to check, um, check a lot of terminology. You can also include um, language rules about uh, things you want to check in, uh, in your language. You know, punctuation, French has this crazy um, rule where you have to have a hard space before double punctuation marks. So this is something that, by the way, is hell in games because not, now it's better than in the past. Not all game engines liked hard spaces and it was always horrible. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, but rules like that, you need to be able to check, and, uh, and those help. Um, now, honestly, we work a lot with the MemoQ tool, because MemoQ has an integrated tool, and, and it works pretty well. Um, most of the time, it's, it's good, especially if you work with a good term base uh, to be able to <coughs> check uh, terminology. It's, um, it's nice. I'm not trying to tell MemoQ, but it's <laughs> a nice tool. <laughs> Um, after working with for a few years with Nature the Studio, I really enjoy this one. <laughs> um, here's an example of what we receive from uh, from one of our clients. So um, in that case, the developer publisher uh, altogether. So it's an Excel file, as you can see. Um, it includes uh, an ID column. Um, well, I don't know. I don't think you can see it so well. But in that case, there are key strings. So those are great because they give you information about where the text is, um, what type of text it is. So uh, it's going to be a mission and usually tells you who is speaking, which is also great. Um, then source language. And in that case, we have lots of columns with the, with the target. So French, Spanish, Italian, German, Portuguese, voice German, so big. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so this is how we, <laughs> this is how we receive the, the files. And this is what it looks like in MemoQ. So there is a great function in MemoQ. Sorry, you're going to hear a lot of MemoQ. So there is this new function in MemoQ which allows you to um, import multilingual files by saying, hey, this is the context column, this is the source, and here I have seven uh, target columns. And when you work with lots of languages, it's nice. It's very nice. So this is what we use. <laughs> Um, but here you have access to the, the German text. So you see it looks quite similar to uh, what you have in Excel, except that the, the context is going to be written here, and here you can see what's in the other um, columns as well, because the, the file is already translated. Otherwise, the German column is empty, of course. But this is the same file. And then like, at the end, we export, and we end up with this again, with all the columns with that. Translation metrics, uh, I don't know if that is very interesting, but it's uh, usually we consider 2,500 words per day. And in technical translation, it goes up to 4,000, I think. Um, but for video games, that's, that's what we usually work with. 
uh, proofreading, a proofreader can proof up to 10,000 words per day. I think it's a bit much actually, closer to 8,000, so that they are able to do last minute checks and, and really be able to see everything. But um, yes, those are the most important. So that's it for the translation part. That was very fast, I know, but if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to uh, the audio part, which is the, I would say, the second most important aspect of uh, what we do in a localization company, but uh, other people will say it's the first one. <laughs> um, so, lots of players, um, if, um, for instance, for dialogues, um, many players are going to expect it uh, to be translated so that they can understand everything. It's, um, it's pretty important. And um, if, they, uh, if they have a um, uh, uh, dubbed game, they will expect good quality. And this is something that uh, you will see on all the blogs uh, whenever a game is released. Someone is going to talk about the localization. They are going to talk about the voices, uh, who, is, uh, who is acting in the... It, it's important and it's something that, uh, especially in Germany actually, it's, uh, you see it more in Germany than in other countries. So, um, who is the voice of this character, and what have they done before, and uh, is it good, is the voice good, is it the voice you imagine for this character? There are lots of uh, elements taken into account, and uh, it's pretty important, yes, so, um, especially, so, especially in Germany. It's not the same in France, but uh, <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> no, no, but uh, yeah, I've spent more time uh, in Germany. Um, so audio is the, it's actually quite a, a bunch of different tasks that we do and we group under the, this title audio. Uh, it is not just a recording, it's all the preparation work, it's just for instance selecting the voices, doing casting, uh, um, booking actors, this is a, a crazy, crazy task, trying to book actors. Um, sometimes there is a bit of uh, writing uh, done on the script or um, STC checks, which I will mention uh, later, to make sure the, the script is okay for uh, what we're going to do and uh, the text is good and the length is okay. Um, so it's. Uh, that's true. Um, then there is the, the recording as well, uh, work on the files, which may include uh, working on special effects or. Uh, like giving special effects to the voice, uh, creating sound effects, creating music. Um, so all this uh, is also into the audio category and it's quite a bit of different things, but it might be taken into account. Um, for this you have, so you need uh, quite a, a few people actually, and you need the equipment. Uh, you cannot just do that on a computer in a normal room. So you need a recording studio, you need a post-pro studio, um, all these things that I don't always understand. But <laughs> no, uh, so yeah, you, you need the proper equipment. Um, anything that's going to be recorded um, that is not good quality, everyone is going to hear it. So it's pretty important. And the, the client, the publisher, the developer is going to listen to the file and say, hey, why can I hear your neighbor talking? It doesn't work. So we have to be careful about that. Um, so we do have, a, we work, um, Internally, we do have a studio, a recording studio in our company, but we do uh, only German there. And for everything else, we work with partner studios. Even though in Berlin it's easy to find um, other uh, languages, people from uh, France. Or it is easy, yes, but you have to take into account other cultural elements. And uh, for instance, if you, need, if you have a big game and you need um, 125 characters, and, and the client wants this to be done by 50 actors. So yeah, one actor can do several voices, of course. But uh, you need to find 50 people. That means that if you're going to do a casting, you need to send at least uh, 100 voices to the client, or 150. So you need to have these people. And you cannot, uh, you cannot select voices from uh, other countries if you're going to uh, do the recording in-house, because then you need to have them come if they are selected. So, just for this reason, it's, uh, it's nice to work with the studios in the, in the country. And also, there are some, um, as always, cultural elements um, and to know. And in particular, knowing the rules 
and the, the laws of the country. Um, for instance, you need to record a child's voice. It's not that easy. You know, you cannot just use a, a child's voice in all countries without rules. It's, uh, it's very specific and uh, in some countries it's going to be okay, in some other countries you're going to need to use um, adult, which sounds, like a, which sounds like a child, for instance in Germany or in France, most of the time, uh, because it's a bit more complicated to, um, to make a, a child work. So things like that that you don't always know, um, are, are good to, it's better to have someone else who knows them uh, and helps you with that. So that's... Uh, of course, the process is pretty straightforward. Select voices. Uh, once the, the, the actors are, are selected, then you're booking. Um, it's a bit more complex than just finding a, a translator. These people are always going left and right, and you need to you have a schedule, and you need to try to fit things around. Um, they, are, these, uh, they actually have agents who work on that, and the booking, uh, they can be there at this time, and there at this time, because they're moving from studio to studio. Um, when you're not doing it, it's pretty funny. You make fun of people just spend their day on the phone. When you have to do it, it's not that much fun. <laughs> I don't have to do it, so I can just laugh at my colleagues. Um, the recording part, though, for someone like me, is awesome. You get to, you know, especially when you work on the translation of a text, and you get to have this pretty big guy who comes in, fat my voice, comes in the studio and records, and you're like, Amazing voice, uh, uh, he gets it right the first time, he knows the tone, the style, everything. It's, it's always great. And um, as a translator, it's really nice to be able to see what the text you've translated is going to uh, be. And um, that's great when you've translated a game and then you can play the game. That's fantastic. But while you wait, it's nice to have this part as well. So, and then post-production, working on the file, um, the QA as well, it's just cleaning the files, making sure uh, the, the sound is good, the quality is good, and then delivering. Uh, okay, the metrics, that's really, I'm giving you these numbers, but I don't, uh, I don't know much about this, so I'm not going to comment it. This I can explain though, um, I think I mentioned it a bit earlier. Um, for audio, uh, constraints are important. So you have, a, you have a file in one language, it needs to be recorded in another language. It's not as simple as that. Okay, so first, uh, once the, the translation is perfect, okay, the translation is good, but still um, you have different, uh, different constraints. The most the simplest one is uh, like a normal time constraint, and it's plus or minus 10% of the original file. Uh, that means that uh, the translated line, uh, when it's pronounced, is going to be maybe 5% longer than the, than the original, and that's okay. So up to 10% um, longer or, or shorter is okay. And this is the first example you see. Um, it doesn't quite match. Well, I don't know, it wasn't cut at the right space. So. But um, one that is very common, though, is a strict time constraint, and that means that it has to be the exact same length. Now, um, you have a sentence in English, you translate it into German. <laughs> Imagine, like, what's the, the probability that it's going to be the same size when it's pronounced? Yeah, it's not that easy, huh? <laughs> um, so, um, and I'm going to talk about this later. That means that before you work on a project, uh, you do the recording of a project which has strict time constraints, you need to have an STC check. STC is strict time constraint. So that's it. And I will, I will talk about this later. Um, but yeah, uh, it's not always that easy. The actor, the actor is going to be great because they can talk a bit faster or a bit slower. And, uh, and they know what they are doing. So usually it works, but it's not enough. Um, the next step is going to be sound sync. Um, so then you need to look at the waveform because it needs um, to be similar. Uh, the, the Recorded one needs to be similar to the original one. It's already, it sounds a bit uh, difficult already. So this, this means that the sounds have to be similar. Uh, it doesn't mean to be exact, but you know, still pretty close. If you look here, of course, this one is moved to the right, but if you move it a bit back, you see that those are quite similar. 
Um, we don't do something very often though. And the last one is lip sync. So everyone has heard about lip sync and everyone knows what lip sync is. Yeah, what you cannot imagine is how difficult it is. Uh, so imagine this same line, like you have this line in English and then it's translated in German. And um, it needs to, basically the, you have someone speaking and it needs to seem as if they are speaking German. That's incredibly difficult. Um, it's, a, it's a different process by itself and uh, it means that the translators have to take this into account when they translate. You cannot just modify the text afterward and rewrite everything. So you need to have a specific team working on that and they need to be experienced. And then it's uh, quite difficult to do. Um, we don't actually do that uh, very often. And usually it's for very short um, audio, um, audio lines, which is nice, because it's uh, incredibly difficult to do. And now I'm going to go straight to the DCC check. So I don't know if we can now. Uh, um, so the SCC check is once you have a translated text, um, you discover that you have to record it, and you need to make sure that the texts are the same uh, length as before. As I showed you, SCC it needs to be exactly the same length. So, yeah, line in English needs to be, when it's spoken, the same length in German. Uh, usually, um, it's done after the translation. This check is just a second proofreading, where the proofreader uh, maybe reads out loud and then <coughs> tries to figure out if it's the same uh, <coughs> it's going to work or not. And I'm going to, I have a few examples here. I need something fun. So this is the original. Alexa! Sorry, it's a little loud. So everyone understood, right? No? <laughs> For reference, he has the job. Achtung, geht in Deckung! Okay. Achtung, geht in Deckung! Okay, and now if we go to the, the English. Watch out, give it everything you've got! <laughs> They delivered this, and uh, no, they delivered the line, and the line was too long, and then we did the, the quality check at the end, and uh, this is too long. So they uh, they sent us this, and I say, hey, look, we re-recorded it. Come on down, give it everything you've got! No. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to doubt what they said, but this doesn't sound to me as if it was actually spoken, it just sound like it was accelerated to make it fit. So this would definitely not work. I mean, if you, if you hadn't heard German, would you understand what it says? No? Right here. When you know it, when you know it, okay. Watch out! Give it everything you've got! Watch out, give it everything you've got. Just in case some of you haven't done it. <laughs> um, and so, this is definitely too long. And where should you have been caught? Um, first, uh, during the translation stage, it's possible. Sometimes you get uh, character limitations or restrictions which tell you this cannot be longer than 100 characters, and then you know you have to stay under 100 characters. It's easy to check at the end if it was respected or not. And then during the ACC check, so um, which is a pretty important step, we, it has to be done before um, an SCC recording. I mean, there is no other solution, otherwise you end up with things like that all the time. And, and this is um, this is a rare, it's a nice example, but it, it doesn't happen all the time, okay? <laughs> um, and then um, during the recording as well, uh, they should have spotted that this was too long um, because they have, you know, they have these, um, they have these on their monitors when they're working on the file. They see exactly what the, the waves look like and how long the files are going to be, and they have to cut. Them. So um, they chose to cut the a line that was too long, and then they chose to just accelerate it and tell us, "Hey, <laughs> look, this is fine." <laughs> so. Um, Yes, it did work. But it's, uh, I'm just, it, once more, <laughs> last time. Watch out! Do everything you've got! Because imagine playing a game, and it's true that sometimes uh, it happens that it, you don't understand everything, it's spoken a bit fast, because you always have this issue. And of course, I mean, Korean is so short. But still, uh, it's not nice to play a game with that, to go back to the, the idea of fun, and, and if you don't understand what's being said, what's the point? I actually have more examples, but uh, I think you've got the, the, the issue there. Um, 
but we had um, so here I mentioned uh, I'll take there is an AD during the recording there is an artistic director who um, directs the, the actor and he's the one who's supposed to say okay this is a uh, check and needs to be the same size this was definitely too long so uh, in a case like that they're supposed to take uh, alternative takes and they record a second take and say okay I did it the, the way it was, so um, if you wanted it that way, you have it that way. But I think it's wrong, and I'm, we are going to do another one. Because if something is wrong, and you don't notice it, and then uh, it goes in the game, it's tested, they say it's wrong, you need to redo it. Then you need to go through the whole process again, and you need to have the actor come back, maybe for one line, one line and you're going to have to pay for one hour. And uh, they get a lot of money for one hour. <laughs> so, um, for one line, they don't get so much money. It's just like one more line, and uh, and it's easier for everyone. So this is the, the main role of the AD, uh, making sure that the, the voices uh, fit within the context and everything uh, everything work for the game. So uh, voice, style, length, all that. And this was not the case. And uh, they always deliver, along with the audio files, they deliver this uh, file where they, they check, okay, this was recorded, this was recorded, and um, when there is an issue, they offer the, the added line to say um, this, this was recorded as um, this, and they put the new line. And we call it the ASREC uh, script as recorded. Now I have more examples. But uh, just to skip. Not uh, bad examples, just examples of what we do. Dororia, Tiran, Arani, Nia, Elf. nicht unser Zuhause. Die Völker Aurorias, die Firren, Harani, Nuyan und Elfen. Wir alle sind Vertriebene. Viele haben die Geschichten von einst vergessen. Sie bestellen die Felder bauen sich eine neue Existenz auf. Doch fernab unserer Städte liegt ein anderer Weg. We love to watch our trailers. Um, it's pretty good, and it's great to give uh, so to give this atmosphere. And, uh, and you know, it's, um, usually we only work on the voices, but the voices have to be selected, and then uh, they uh, they have to be good. Well, the actors have to be good and, and get the style and the character. And um, it's a nice uh, it's a nice way to really see your text uh, in context and uh, have access to the beginning. Now, quality reference or testing. Um, so, lots of um, aspects to take into account. Um, it's really not my specialty there. I know a bit as um, I was working a lot with the testers when I was working at Nintendo. Um, it's useful, especially for larger games. Um, 
it's a bit control. Uh, it's a bit of a controversy because uh, more and more um, the the publishers and the developers don't test the full games, especially in cases of uh, MMOs, for instance. Uh, the budgets are very uh, are very small. Um, one uh, thing that is done very often is um, the first hour of the game is tested. So when the player starts playing the game. Um, Everyone is sure they have good quality, so they start playing, they have good quality, but after one hour they're already hooked. So who cares if the quality is not so great anymore? <laughs> so uh, it's done very often. <laughs> it's not like that um, everywhere. For console games, uh, the testing part is very important because then you work with the compliance um, and uh, these games need to, to uh, pass tests. You know, they have tests and they need to pass lot check, for instance and the terminology needs to be right, you have hardware terminology to follow, um, okay, but in cases of MMOs, very often, uh, so yes, you have the first hour and sometimes spot checks here and there, and the rest is, it depends. <laughs> um, so you have, um, as I said, you have compliance to take into account very often, uh, depending on the, on the platform. Um, the rest, uh, yeah, security, um, say for Nintendo, everything is uh, uh, super secure and no one, needs, no one is allowed to mention anything about the, about the games to anyone, not even to your colleagues when you work on the same game. It's, uh, so you, you have this difference of uh, uh, information for all and who's allowed to uh, know that about the game. Um, same as translators or, or um, like audio um, specialists. It's better to have native people, of course, uh, that are able to understand the language and able to spot uh, any translation mistakes, language mistakes, grammar, spelling, all that, in case the translators let a few one uh, escape, which they should not. But, you know, it happens. So um, it's good to have people who know what they are doing, are able to check the game for lots of different things, including the language. Um, for games, it's even more important than uh, for testing. It's even more important than for translation. That um, those people know about games in general, and they are used to playing games, and they know um, instinctively um, what needs to be where and, and how. And this you get as you play as you play a lot. Um, so before they start working, um, they try to get material. Um, very often, they, they might have access to a first build, which is in the original language. So, um, who hasn't dreamt of playing a game in Japanese before it's even uh, implemented into, into English or French? So, um, usually they start playing the game before uh, it has been translated, and that means they have the original build, um, the, the original game that contains the, the, the text that was uh, written and not yet translated. Um, still, even if they don't understand, that allows them to see what the game looks like and they do, get a, a, they do start to understand uh, what the game is about and what they need to do really quickly, normally. Um, they also have access to um, all the information, uh, reference material, um, maybe some cheats. Um, they do have a, a testing build as well, so they might have codes or a, a special god mode to help them go through the game faster. Um, and of course, they always have uh, documents which are sort of walkthroughs or cheats that will help them as well. Just try to skip some parts and not go through uh, all the text, especially in this first build. If it's in Japanese, maybe they don't need to see all the text. Um, um, what are cheats in that case? Cheats, uh, things that are going to help you. For instance, you know there is a hidden uh, passage that will help you go through another uh, world or another level without having to go through the first level. And if oh. you need to check the second level um, as soon as possible, it's nice to know about this. So it's just basically any information, you know, uh, if you know there is a bug in the game, uh, it's not supposed to be like that later, but for now it's like that, and of course you're going you're gonna to use it. Or it can just be codes, for instance, or if you press on uh, three buttons together, it's going to move you to uh, this, and it's going to fill up your, your meters to, uh, for health and... and weapon or whatever, you know. So basically anything that will help you go through the game faster. Mm -hmm. I remember playing uh, the testing build for Mario, for instance, where there was a code that would allow me that would allow me to float through the level 
not even going on the ground, so you would go through anything until the end of the level. <laughs> That's how I finished the game. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was not very good with games when I started at Nintendo. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, things like that, that will help you. <coughs> uh, since then, I'm much better. Okay, now I can, I can play it. I have it and I play it. I just wanted to mention that. Um, so yeah, they use the uh, bug tracking tools and, and different platforms to uh, plot their bugs. I don't know much about those, unfortunately, so I'm not going to tell you much about those. But um, I've seen quite a, a few bug reports and I know uh, it's important to write uh, really clear reports and uh, to write clear bugs as well, because those are going directly to the developer uh, who might not speak English, for instance. It needs to be clear, it needs to be short. They need to understand uh, right away what the issue is. So uh, those are, are pretty important. It's about the communication, um, especially if you're trying to uh, present an issue that might not be considered as major by everyone, but you feel it's pretty important for your culture or your language. Um, if you're able to write it in a way that will convince other people, it's better. So it's pretty important to you to be able to uh, write concisely and um, clearly. Um, one thing um, the testers might have to um, implement all the, the changes themselves if they have access to the log kit uh, or to the, the text in the cat tool or to the text itself uh, or they might have to go back through uh, the translation team to have the translation team uh, uh, change everything and in that case um, that means that those teams work together to be able to, to do that Then one pass or multiple passes, this, is a, uh, this goes back to the question of budget I was mentioning at the beginning. Um, so it depends on the budget, uh, if they are going to check the game once or twice. And if uh, once the, bug have been, uh, the bugs have been corrected, are they going to regress them? That means checking again the game to see first that the bug is not there anymore, and second that removing the bug hasn't added another one. <laughs> Let's say one word is incorrect, you correct it you go again and suddenly the line is too long. That happens uh, all the time, so you have to be careful. And it's always uh, important uh, to, to go back over the text once the once a bug has been fixed, because one fix might be another issue. So um, those are the, the main reasons for, for testing. Um, First, being able to check uh, what has been done already because things go through, mistakes go through, unfortunately. They should not, but people are, are people. We're human, and so um, also um, translators might not have access to the game itself, or um, they, might, they are not able to see the game in context. And this is what the testers can do. They, they see the game, they see where the text was implemented, and it, it always looks different. Um, they see the characters as well, and uh, maybe the translator thought this uh, was a guy from the beginning and it looks like it's a woman at the end, and then it might not fit anymore, so... And that's also when the audio is implemented, and that's when you see as well if it, it works or it doesn't work. And then you cross your fingers that it works, because audio is very expensive to redo. And this is where also they check for compliance and all the, the terminology. Uh, which is very important for console games. Um, yeah, so this is uh, basically how uh, like a, a basic uh, uh, project goes. Um, well, maybe not basic, but ideal. <laughs> uh, so the testers first, uh, no, I think I've, I've more or less mentioned that, but the testers have access to the game and to the and to information before they before the testing starts. Um, then they have the first field and they are able to check um, the, the text and um, then they have a final field and they are able to, to check again um, the text in the second pass and regress their bugs. So that's very basic. DDP is going to be very, very short. So basically, it just what, what do we uh, take into account? Uh, because it's true that most of the time the graphics, uh, we do not work on the graphics. What we can do is, uh, what I said earlier, say, hey, look, um, this doesn't work, this needs to be changed. But then the graphics is going to be for the developers to change. We're not going to play with that. 
but um, there is still um, in the text that I was mentioning at the beginning, uh, all the text that surrounds the video game, there might still be a, a bit of work to do, especially with the manuals and, uh, and also with the demos and the packaging. Those are the most important. The rest is just uh, basic. So uh, when we might have to work on the text, make it look nicer, work on the layout, uh, maybe change some colors, but that's also quite simple. So, that was it for desktop publishing. So, um, I think um, why is a good localization important? And this is what we discussed before, because uh, localization is to recreate um, an atmosphere that was uh, created already during the, the first uh, the game design, but um, the player um, in who understands another language and doesn't understand the source language, they need to be able to get back into this atmosphere and, uh, and try to uh, and understand everything. So they want to they want to know what's going on. They want to be able to read every single word, and they have a right to. And it helps them uh, get into the, the game. Um, especially you have lots of games that rely on, on humor. And they have a lot of uh, mission text, quests. Well, sometimes you need to really know what's going on. It's not just the item and go get this item, but you have a lot of text. Now you have a lot of text in uh, MMORPGs or in RPGs, so um, it's quite important. And you have uh, always this atmosphere, these little characters with their special language, and, uh, and all that is uh, used. And this is what the localization is supposed to do. Um, so the rest is obvious. So. Uh, Machine translation is going to lower the quality, especially if you don't edit and post edit it. <laughs> um, you still see it a lot. You see um, lots of developers, uh, especially in Asia, um, do write the, they write the games in English directly because it's cheaper. And then uh, <laughs> yes, and then we have to translate this into German, into French, and, but we have no idea what it says. <laughs> but it, uh, it's funny when you talk about it, but when you're in front of it, it's not that funny. And it happens all the time. Uh, it's, it's common. Um, it's very easy to say, hey, look, I speak English. Um, I do speak English. I'm not going to translate anything into English, obviously. Or people will laugh at me. But it, it happens a lot that uh, people want to uh, cut costs, try to uh, cut corners as well. And it's a shame. It's a shame for the game experience, it's a shame for the players, it's a shame for the atmosphere, it's a shame for the fun in general. So uh, that's how it works. Um, in Germany in particular, this is what I was uh, saying, uh, lots of people actually talk about uh, the localization of the game, and especially if it has audio. Um, so it's really easy to just go up or down. Uh, you read things such as, as usual, poor localization, or things like that that are not so nice to read. Now I'm just like as a conclusion, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about how to get into uh, uh, video game localization. Well, it depends on uh, what you want to do and uh, what's your, your subject. Lots of people actually start as testers because if you have uh, if you have studied your language and you know about uh, about games. It's quite easy to start working as a as a tester. Um, lots of people also start as translators, um, if, especially if you study translation or video game translation. It's, it's in there. Uh, you have lots of positions also as project manager. Uh, you can work in the audio department. So all across, there are quite a few positions that are open. Internships, <laughs> a great way to start. And I only mention it because we are looking for interns, of course. <laughs> no, um, internship. I started with an internship, and um, then I was hired in that company. Um, so I'm, I'm never going to say anything bad about internships. Um, it's great to be able to gain experience because of your CV. Um, the law has changed now, so you are sure that your internship is going to be uh, valued and uh, and uh, and will look good on your CV. Um, what we look for when we want to recruit people, at least uh, what I look for when I recruit people, um, mostly what they have studied, um, maybe linguistic, uh, linguistics, translation, so uh, here German as well. Um, so for audio, uh, they need to have studied audio. 
um, translation is a bit more general, so if you study technical translation, it could be okay if you play video games as well, um, that could work. Uh, so that the strong interest in video games is important. And then we, we look at general profiles of so the studies, the experience, all that. We go to specific websites and we always test the translators we work with, so um, that's quite important. We send a, a little uh, creative test that reflects what we do on a regular basis. So that's it. And then uh, Lotjam, so we are, um, our company is a, uh, yeah, I wanted to go back to Lotjam. Our company is a jury for Lotjam, so uh, uh, that's uh, how we are here today for this little workshop. Thank you very much for inviting me, that's very nice. But uh, as a jury, we are going to uh, read through the, the different translations, and we are actually quite looking for that, I'm looking forward to that, because, uh, I mean, I have colleagues who did that last year as well, and uh, it was a great experience. And some people get uh, pretty creative with their translations, and it's always uh, it's always great to uh, to see what people do with the creative test, the uh, text, and, and uh, what they can do in their own language. So of course, I'm not going to um, check the German translations, <laughs> unfortunately. But I can I can have a quick look. I'm not going to judge them, but to be honest, I do speak a few words of German. I just try to hide it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, if any of you want to uh, start training, you have access to last year's lock kit, I think, the first one. And there is already a beta available, I think. So uh, don't hesitate. It's fun as well. And that's it. Any questions? Yes, first of all, thank you very much. I think, uh, or I'm very happy that you stressed lots of things that are important in general software localization, but which are of importance here in the video game localization field. Uh, and um, I thought it, it is very interesting uh, when you explain, for instance, the different steps one has to go, uh, to go through in a video localization um, process or project. And one thing I uh, asked myself is uh, the, the, the post-mortem um, you, you mentioned. Is this really something um, you spend a lot of time with? Because I heard that many agencies or companies, yes, they have this as a more or less theoretical step at the end of the project, but uh, what is your experience with um, this uh, phase at the so, end of the So project? it's true, uh, for instance, at Nintendo, we have a post-mortem of every single project. Things are all seen a bit different, and that's a, a client sign for us. And, and it's important to try to make things better. And now, um, we don't do it all the time. We do it for larger projects, yes, especially when it involves audio and translation to uh, make the communication between everyone smoother, or if there is testing as well, testing and translation, because we need to, to find a way to just make it uh, flow better. Uh, otherwise, it depends on what our clients um, expect or want, um, but we try to have one internally, actually. So um, whenever, whenever we have a post-mortem with the client, we have another one uh, internally, and maybe with our translators as well. Um, so it's always two post-mortems in that case, because we don't put our translators in, in relations with our clients, of course. But um, yeah, uh, internally we try to do it for larger projects or more complicated projects. Uh, we have some projects where like, every month we're going to get 2,000 words, and we know the project, and then we don't do it, you know, these regular updates. But for anything that's larger, or uh, when we suffer through the project, we, we try to find out what we can do to make it better, and, uh, and it, it usually improves the quality. Because when you get rushed on a, on a project, uh, which happens often, but uh, you might want to cut corners of what uh, I need to get that done, uh, what do I do? So, um, I mean, my presentation was mostly turned uh, on uh, really what we do in the company, of course. It's different from the theory. It's not always what you should do, <laughs> uh, and that's why it's important to learn the theory first. But yeah, post-mortems, um, it's great to do them, you should do them all the time. We don't do them all the time, I have to admit. But uh, we try to discuss the projects internally when we have several people working on it, and, and it's not that easy. 
Yes. Yes. Thank you. Are there other questions from the audience? No. Not for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you once again. So and uh, you can uh, take the opportunity and talk to Karine, uh, perhaps concerning an internship, because this is certainly something very interesting mm -hmm. to gain experience in the field. Why not? And uh, yes. So thank you very much. We will have a break of about just 20 minutes. <laughs>